And okay, welcome everyone to week, is it three? Week three of uh, OLS4. Um, so for some of you, this may be your first OLS call and we are utterly, utterly delighted to have you here and to welcome you all. Uh, so today, our plan, we will go through a few bits of housekeeping. If I'm looking away from the screen when I'm talking, it's because I'm looking at my other screen where the call notes are, just to remind me what's going on. Um, so I can see already quite a few of you have uh, just signed in on the Etherpad notes. Um, if you haven't, please do feel free to do so now. We have roundabout line 58, you can add your name, or line 77, we're asking for you to share a song uh, that expresses your personality or that is just you know constantly playing on your speakers um, or that you wish was playing on your speakers right now. Um, and bonus points if you add a YouTube link or something so that others can enjoy it and we can end up with a beautiful playlist. Um, the other thing that you can do uh, with Etherpad, on the very top right of the Etherpad, there's a little icon. Right now it says 17 and there's three people. If you click on that, you can select a color so that when you're typing, you have the correct color. Like there's certain colors that just wouldn't be yellow and I, I have to be yellow. So I don't know, you, you, may, you may feel a similar need for expression, so go for it. Um, and you don't have to add your name, but you can do. Um, and that way, when someone hovers over text that you've written, then they can actually see who, who is um, talking at any given time. Um, but it's fine to re remain anonymous as well, if you prefer. Um, and let me see what's next in terms of kicking off the call. Uh, so we have a nice blog post if you want to share the announcement around OLS4. Um, by now, hopefully you have had an introduction and a chat with your mentor uh, or your mentee, if you are a mentor who's joined the call. Uh, if any of you for any reason haven't met with your mentor or mentee um, and you're worried about that, please let us, and by us, I mean the OLS organizing team, let us know and we will help you figure out what's going on. Uh, hopefully it is all good. Um, this call is transcribed. So when you joined the call, you probably got a little notification that saying that the call is being live streamed. This does not mean we are going straight to like to YouTube. Uh, we will edit and review things um, before it goes to YouTube. Uh, what it does mean, um, the live streaming is uh, going to otter.ai. Um, and so on the top left of the screen, you can probably see where it says live on Otter AI. Click here to open live transcript. Uh, so this is an automatic uh, transcription of what we are saying, uh, which can help you follow along as well. Um, looking at my notes to see what else I need to be mentioning. Righty, um, as part of the transcription, uh, one thing to note is that we will have breakout rooms throughout the call. And what that means is that we are broken out into smaller subgroups uh, where you will be speaking with usually two or three other people. Um, and breakout rooms do not have the otter.ai transcription. Um, and so for that purpose, we offer two options for participation. One is to participate um, in a spoken manner, just speaking with one another. But the other option is that you can type into chat. Um, so that could be typing in the etherpad or typing in the Zoom chat. So that's the written breakout room option. Um, and in order to sort everyone into rooms correctly, based on your preference, what we're gonna ask everyone to do quickly now, if you can, is to actually modify your Zoom name and if you prefer a written breakout room, choose W, just put W in front of your name like you can see Emmy has done now. Um, or if you prefer a spoken breakout room, uh, pr you add S in front of your name like Malvika has. Um, and so when I modify my name, I'm on a Mac. Uh, what I do is I click on the participants list at the bottom of the screen. And then once that is um, open, I go to my name and I, there's a little blue button that says more. I click on more, it gives me the option to rename and to add that S or W in front of my name. So I'm just going to quickly do that. And I would prefer written because I know it's quiet in the hotel at night and I don't think everyone wants to be listening to me talking. This is an arbitrary scenario. I'm not actually in a hotel, uh, <laughs> but uh, just helps you choose. Um, so I will just pause for a moment and give everyone, almost everyone's done it. But yeah, the couple more people just need to do that. Um, if anyone has any difficulty, uh, changing names for any reason, we may just ping you and ask what preference you prefer um, in the Zoom chat. Uh, okay. Um, oh, yes. One other thing before we kick off a bit further is that um, Open Life Science has a code of conduct. Um, so I would encourage everyone to take a minute uh, when you can read through that code of conduct and just understand it. It doesn't take long to review. Um, the the two-moment summary is 
basically treat one another respectfully, kindly and thoughtfully. Um, so please do read that. And um, Emmy's just thankfully, helpfully pasted that in the chat as well. Um, as a general rule, if you at any point feel that you've um, either experienced or witnessed something that isn't in line with the code of conduct, um, then please do report it to us. So there's, there's a couple of ways you can report that. Uh, you can report to the Open Life Science team. That's team at openlifesci.org. Um, all of this info is round about line 100 on the etherpad right now. Um, and the team at openlifesci.org email address reaches the four Open Life Science founders. That's myself, Berenice, Malvika, and Emmy. Um, but if you if you don't want to reach all of us, if you'd like if you'd rather reach one of us individually, perhaps because you're reporting one of us, then you can also email us individually. So you could email Bernice at openlifesci.org, uh, Yo, Malvika, etc. And all of our email addresses right now are at line 102, so that you don't have to try and decipher them from me having just spoken them, which is always very hard. Um, I think those are all of the sort of housekeeping details. Um, so what we will do first, uh, next, is we will launch into the um, lightning round table, uh, which is always good fun. Um, so if you've been on a Zoom call with lots of people um, or any meeting with lots of people, you probably are familiar with the fact that um, introductions can take ages and ages and ages. Uh, if, we, if there's 30 of you and everyone actually wants to give a good paragraph about their life history, um, and we love you and we want to know about your life history, but it will be exhausting if we get that, that deep in. So what we're going to ask for instead is four quick things. I'm going to try and demonstrate it and not stray off the rules this time. Um, so if you look at line 113, there are prompts. There are what is your name? What is your location? What is your project? And what is your most recent hobby? Four things brup, 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 over to the next person. And what we will do is we will go in the order of the roll call for introductions. So you can take a look at the roll call in the etherpad, line 46, and see who's next and who's coming up. Uh, so I'm going to go, and then I will nominate the next person. I think Berenice actually isn't here, so I'll skip over to Emmy. But I'll give it a go, and then I will nominate the next person, and then Emmy will do that, and she'll nominate the next person, and so on. But we'll also try and add prompts in the chat just to help you follow. Hopefully that's clear. So anyway, uh, me, hey folks, I am Yo. I'm based in Cambridge, UK. Uh, my project name, uh, given that I am not a mentee, I will say my project name is Open Life Science. And my most recent hobby, cycling. I, I have managed to get a watch tan in like two weeks, which I am super impressed at because I've been wearing sunscreen the whole time. Um, <laughs> and Emmy, over to you. Yo, you're straight again. <laughs> I'm Emmy. I am located in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. I, my project is also Open Life Science and my recent hobby is running. Hand over to Malvika. Hi everyone, I'm Malvika Sharan. My project is also Open Life Science. Uh, one of the recent things that I've been enjoying a lot is uh, oil painting, uh, which is quite common. I will add in the chat for the next person. Keep an eye out. I don't think Jyoti is here, so I think it's Batul. Uh, hi, everyone. I am Batul Marzu, located in Saudi Arabia. Uh, my project is about uh, citizen science project in genomics, and my recent hobby is gardening. So the next one is Ewa. I hope I pronounced it right. Hello, probably it's me. <laughs> I'm Eva. Um, Eva is from uh, Poland, so that's my location. Um, particularly in Odra Basin. Uh, my project is uh, River University, open education and open science platform in Baltic region. My most recent hobby I got back to again is uh, yoga. Thanks, and uh, I'm forwarding to Silsia. Um, I think it might be Lena next. Is it? 
Shall I let her go and then come in later? I'll do that. Okay. I'll now. Sure, of course. So next is, uh, okay. Uh, this is Lina Mahlifi. I'm from Saudi Arabia, located, located in Saudi Arabia, Riyadh. And my project is uh, metagenomics. I work actually with Dr. Mitchell. And uh, my hobby is swimming. And nice to meet you all. This is the first time for me. Nice to meet you all. So the next is going to be uh, Cecilia. Is it, is, I'm pronouncing your name perfectly. It was a good try, but it is Silcha. But mm -hmm. thank you, Lena. Silcha. Yeah. So my name is Silcha, and I'm uh, in York in the United Kingdom. And my project is called Eros Stories. And Eros is uh, Education Researchers for Open Science. Oh. And uh, hobby. I've been um, I've been acting as a dungeon master for my family's Dungeons and Dragons games recently. So next, I think we have uh, is it Yin? Um, yep, um, my name is Yin Kwan. I'm in Los Angeles, California. My project is a iNaturalist data explorer. And my hobby is um, urban sketching. Uh, next is Lily Winfrey. Hi, everyone. I'm Lily. I'm in Austin, Texas, and I am a mentor. And I get to work with Florence. And her project is environmental mapping for urban farming project. And I have been doing water coloring. And next up is Jessica. Hi everybody, I'm Jessica. I am in New Hampshire in the US and I am a mentor. I'm working with Andrea and her project is um, creating a guide for reproducible research for decision, decision science researchers. Uh, and a hobby I've been doing a lot of lately is reading. And next up is uh, Sebastian. Hello everyone. I am Sebastian, I am located in Quito, Ecuador, and my project is um, BioInfo Starter Pack, an open educational resource for bioinformatics enthusiasts, written in Spanish, and um, my last hobby is cycling, um, yeah, the nice video, and the next one is Guillermo. Hi everyone, my name is Guillermo, uh, I am from Argentina, Buenos Aires. Uh, and my project is named uh, Open Data for Nanosystem. Uh, um, my hobby uh, recently is doing yoga and reading sci-fi. Next one is Mai. Hi everyone, I am Mayra Ajaji from Saudi Arabia. Um, I'm working with Batul and Lina. Um, open life science, metagenomic drug discovery. Uh, I would uh, say my recent hobby is hiking. Um, next is Alejandro. Hi, everyone. My name is Alejandro. I am from Buenos Aires, Argentina. My project is Tacheres Open Source, which are Spanish workshops about open source tools. And my re most recent hobby is uh, having fun with 3D printing. I think I'm the last one, right? I think we've ah, we've had Andrea. Um, if you ah, if you are maybe uh, in that case, Andrea, maybe just add your um your introduction in the chat, and we will read it out. That would be great. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry, I've been using my phone, so it hasn't been the best. Um, so my name is Gail, uh, and um, I am from York. I'm affiliated with the University of York, and I am a mentee. I work with Silsha on the Eero stories, and my most recent hobbies is walking. <laughs> Early morning walks, that is. Um, I'll pass on to the next person. I'm not sure who that is. Next up is Ceci. Ceci. 
Ceci, I don't know if you caught that. Um, are you free to introduce or if you prefer, you can use the chat if that's easier. Okay, um, I think we'll move on. Uh, Juan? Okay, yeah, here I will. Uh, I'm Juan from Buenos Aires. Uh, I'm in a team with Guillermo uh, in the project for open data and systems, and I enjoy swimming. Uh, nice to meet you. All. Fantastic. So I'm just going to loop back. Um, Andrea, if you want to add any intros in the chat, please feel free to. Same uh, for Ceci. Um, if not, I'm going to pause for just a moment. Um, and thanks to everyone who has added in those icebreaker question um, music links. If you want to still add yours, please do. Ah, Ceci, you're alive. Excellent. Hi, sorry, I had just stepped out. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I'm a doctoral student at the University of Buenos Aires, and I'm working with Alejandro Camara and other people on our team on Tacheres Open Source. And I mean, Alex probably talked to you about this, but it's um, what we're trying to build now is, is more of a community aspect to, to carry out these educational um, links between people that know open source tools and that are using them in an academic context and uh, people who want to learn. And that often happens in a laboratory when, when you join a lab, oh, excuse me, you join a lab and you have um, a big brother, a big sister, and, uh, and they show you the ropes, but some people um, don't have access to that. And I think uh, the, the main point of our, of our course, uh, courses are to you know, help people and um, reduce the barrier to adoption of different, of different tools, and especially if, if those are open source. And that's part of what we're going to do is in open life sciences to um, work on the on the community aspect of that because we have the, like the calls uh, the, the the courses set up and, and that, that part of interaction is is working pretty well but we need um, help from from our mentors I and mean, you know, especially in in setting up our, our community <laughs> so thank you for this opportunity thanks so much Ceci and I'm just going to read from Andrea we have my name is Andrea Evramescu I really hope I got that right uh, one day if you need to correct me please do um, I'm a final year PhD student at the University of Manchester and an enrichment student at Alan Turing um, I'm looking forward to working with Jessica and trying to create a guide for decision science students decision sciences students covering open data and reproducible research I like to do puzzles and play video games in my free time. Nice to meet you all. Um, okay, and with that, have we missed anybody who would like to do an intro? I think we're good. Uh, so, uh, Malvika, you get the next bit. Thank you so much. It was so, so great to uh, learn about each of you. And uh, I see there are lots of swimmers, walkers, painters, and sci-fi lovers. So with that, that is a good segue probably to talk about open life science. Yeah. Increase that. So you might already know a lot of this, but this is to make sure that we are all on the same page and we all understand the program the way we uh, expect. So this is open life science and we're very excited that you're here. Um, these are the four people. Uh, so you've heard from you, you've heard from Amy, it's me, and then you would also have chance to meet Berenice if you haven't already. And four of us would be organizing this cohort. But um, I want to also just say that we would have lots of facilitators who are returning member from previous or previous cohorts. So you would hear from not just us, but lots of other people. And we are very excited for you to learn more about them. So all uh, we have in common, four of us, we don't work together in same location, but we came together on the basis that we believe that to be effective, science should be shared openly with others and made freely available. So this is a simplified version of what you would hear about open research or open science everywhere. But the common mission is to make sure that whatever we are building is to be shared with people. 
and we are not alone in this journey. We've been running for two years and we have uh, over 250 people uh, who have worked with us as mentors, as uh, project leads like you. And there's lots of knowledge that we have accumulated over time. So please reach out to us for anything, uh, any question, any resource that might be useful for you. And you're gonna be part of this uh, big group of community that uh, we are building here. The Open Life Science Program helps individuals and research groups in becoming open science ambassadors. So this is our guiding principle that what we want to do is to make sure that anybody who joins the program are equipped with enough knowledge, resources, and connections that they can advocate for open science in their own community, wherever they are. So coming back to this common ground of believing in open science as a way to advance knowledge, we also believe that when we share our work, our work advances and as a result, science advances collectively. But a lot of time researchers are often skeptical, skeptical about sharing their work due to their own fear of getting scooped, being criticized, or often not knowing where to start. So how can we work openly without becoming scientifically vulnerable? So when we talk about scientific vulnerability is uh, all the uh, fear that we may have around uh, what if someone scoops my work? What if someone steals my work? What if someone finds out that there are problems in my research and I didn't mean to make that error? Um, and this is what we explore in Open Life Science. We try to take step with you, uh, along with you, to explore different concepts and practices in open science and apply them in, in our work one step at a time. Open science is a very big uh, field. This is where we don't expect you to learn and understand everything, but take the most important and most urgent concept that we are teaching you and apply it at your work. Whatever you would learn here, you would not see the direct uh, application of all of them in your project immediately, but we uh, are very confident that you would come back to those in your future work as well. So this is 15 week long mentorship and cohort based training and it ends in 16th week, week with graduation. So we would always have an alternate week. This week is exceptional, but generally you would have cohort based training one week and the next week you would have an on one mentoring uh, with your mentor. Uh, and between these two, you would do hands-on practice. But today we are doing these two on the same week because we really wanted to meet all the people and give them the chance to be onboarded in the program so they get to know what kind of resources we have, who the other people are, and so on. And the hands-on practice are facilitated through different assignments. So in the first few weeks, you would get lots of assignments, but over you know period, it, it just starts to reduce because in the beginning, you're creating resources and maps for you, which you will come back to as you develop your project later on. Uh, a lot of our resources are built on Mozilla Open Leadership Framework, where uh, all of us uh, from the organizing team have uh, developed our own skill as open researchers. So if you would like to learn more, you can go to this link. And as you might see that the link to the slide is available on the etherpad. So who are open leaders? Open leaders are people who design, build and empower their projects and communities for understanding, sharing and participation and inclusion. So there are three uh, in the X axis, you can th think of it that there are design, build and empower. And in the y-axis, you have understanding, sharing, and participation. This is something we will come back to over and over in all the talks that we do. So this is what I was talking about access. So you have design, build, empower, understanding, sharing, participation, and inclusion. So everything that we build, we want to make sure that these are designed for people, built with, uh, built with sharing and participation in mind, and empowering others to understand the knowledge that you're building. So these slides are available to you. You're not expected to learn about uh, this particular table, but we will come back and contextualize what we are gonna teach you every time. So what does open science mean, right? Open science is huge, huge umbrella term. It comes with lots of different knowledge and each of you have different project as you already heard. So one can have project, which is about sharing your data openly. You can, you wanna share your source code openly, which is open source uh, software. You might wanna create your own hardware, uh, share your paper or protocol. You wanna share result early on, which is preprint. 
And then you also can share your open reviews. Um, you can have open education. You want to involve people uh, in citizen science. Uh, or you can even you know, support and connect others in your field through scientific networks or community building. So you can see open life science as one of those. So a lot of research resources that the open life science generate actually sits across different of these. So you know, we can have a source code for let's say website that we're building, which falls under this. Uh, we might have data of you know, how many people have been trained and we share under open data. So whenever you deal with different uh, objects or different aspects of open science, you would probably want to learn about different things. But the common idea is that we, we, we want to be conscious about what we are designing. It's not just by default open, but we are thinking why we are opening it, who we are opening it for, and who will be benefiting from those. So one study from 2012 said that 160 tech companies found that level of strategic intent in openness and not just openness alone correlates with market performance. Uh, and this is something we're talking about where uh, startup companies thrive. So design openness into your work. Don't let it be a thoughtless default. Uh, and therefore, these framework that we showed you as a table would be very, very useful. So with your leadership and vision combined with open life science mentoring and training, we truly believe you can achieve positive culture change in your community. With that, I will stop sharing and uh, open up for questions you may have. If you don't have any question, don't worry. This is just the first call and we are here. You can always come back to this and you know, ping us on Slack, Slack channel, ask each other. We just love to see all these connections happening. And with that, I'm going to actually pass it to Emmy. Thank you, Malvika. Yeah, we, you, you will see as uh, all that progresses um, that we are not afraid to leave silent spaces in our calls to let you think about questions and ask them. And of course, when you first hear something, I usually take the time to digest it and I won't think about the question, you know, an hour later or something. You can always also ask on Slack where, you know, the whole community is available as well. Um, but moving on from there, thank you so much, Malvika, for the nice introduction. Um, and now is your introduction to something called breakout rooms. Might be very familiar to some of you, but this is the first time you're doing it in OLS. And so we'll introduce our own flavor as well. So hopefully you can pay attention for the next one to two minutes. Um, yeah, so what breakout rooms are for? We have a big group here and we'd like to give all of you the opportunity to talk and discuss. And so breakout rooms are really useful in the sense that they split you into smaller groups um, and you can you know, talk to a couple more people in a more intimate setting. Um, so what happens in OLS breakout rooms? Usually we will have a couple of prompts, so questions or tasks that we'd like you to do or discuss. Um, so these are usually on the notes already and we usually copy them into the chat anyway. So for this first set of breakout rooms that you're about to head into, we'd like you to discuss three questions. What was your path into Open Life Science, this mentorship and training program? How did you get into working open? And how has working open affected your leadership? Um, so you will be split into rooms of three people. You will have 10 minutes. So looking at that, that means around three minutes per person to speak. We'd like you to pay attention to how much each of you are speaking approximately and make sure that everyone has more or less equal chances to speak. Um, when I say speak, I also mean write. Very helpful, Emmy. <laughs> we have spoken or written breakout rooms and um, for the spoken rooms, um, you can carry out a spoken conversation between the three of you. Um, and we just ask you to um, take notes where possible and uh, so that you could share out in the note document if you'd uh, like to and um, share your insights and discussions and thoughts with the rest of the cohort. Um, in the break, written breakout rooms, um, we'd like you to discuss in by writing. So 
this is uh, can be done with the Zoom chat. So the Zoom chat aren't uh, visible for people outside of your breakout room when you enter it. So it's only visible for the people inside the room in case you know that you that's something that you are thinking about. Um, so that's just to let you know, or you can use the note document. You will see now that there are uh, the different sections for the different groups that are coming up under line 139. So you can also use that space to do your discussion. Um, when you're in the room, if you need help, there is a ask for help button towards the bottom of your screen on the menu. So press that and we'll be alerted and one of you will be with you right away. Um, did I miss anything? Your thumbs up is really helpful. Thank you. I hope I was clear. If you have questions, um, yeah, press the ask for help or you can um, use the Zoom chat to ask here now. <laughs> uh, Yo, are we more or less ready? We are more or less ready. Uh, so a few groups have two people, which means you'll get five minutes, uh, but most groups have three. Um, and I will open the rooms in three, two, one. Um, learn from that as well. I just, I don't think, yeah, everyone is back. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I hope you all had a good discussion. Hope the breakout room was an um, uh, interesting experience. <laughs> I am going to move to the next bit, I think, in the interest of time as well. But as I was saying, while well, I find my slides, um, <laughs> if you have you know, comments that stick with you, stuck with you during your discussion, you're thinking about it now, um, if you feel comfortable, we'd love to see it on our notes so that we can all learn from it. Um, so please do um, share if possible. Okay, I found my slides. <laughs> So just gonna, I, yeah. just going to interrupt and say some of the notes are so beautiful. It just makes me feel uh, so glad that you all found ways through different people. Yeah, people infrastructure, definitely. Um, but we're, we're very glad to have you here. Um, and we love to, we love seeing that you, you found us as well. Um, okay, I am going to introduce the Open Canvas. This is um, one of my favorite tools, to be honest. Uh, it goes right into what uh, Malvika previously mentioned about open by design. So that intention, that strategy of designing for, uh, hang on, for empowerment and for collaboration. Um, so we'll see what it is in a minute. Um, we will use the open canvas to think through uh, an open project strategy. We will look at example without the S, <laughs> just one example for now. Um, and there will be an assignment where um, you will be asked to create your own open canvas for your project. So we have a template. Um, there is a link in the etherpad already, I think for the template, which you can use. Um, so you don't have to draw the whole thing out from scratch, but you definitely have to fill it in. So, before that, let's see. Um, yeah, again, let's 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 go back to you know why we're learning about this and what this is for. Um, Avika showed this table. So, uh, as she mentioned, we keep we're going to keep going back to this. But the open canvas is particularly useful for uh, us to design for community understanding for uh, the community to look at how we can design to facilitate sharing of knowledge within your projects and community and to design for people, contributors, users to participate in the projects. So it's really about 
intentional strategic design. This is the canvas. Um, I'm thinking about everyone who thought, who said they would like, to, uh, they do uh, water painting or oil painting. It's really quite blank as you would with a painting canvas. Um, has all these different squares. Let me see if, yeah. So there is, uh, that's it zoomed in. Um, so there is a certain path through which you move through different rectangles and squares. Um, so I'll bring, I'll walk you through it relatively slowly um, so you can see, you know, how that works. It's adapted from uh, the, what we call the lean canvas, probably in the business world, if some of you are familiar with it. So that's, that's where it came from. But there is a key difficulty here. I'm going to highlight it here. Um, so in the lean, if you're familiar with the lean canvas, then there, there are all these elements about product, how to build a product that you may be familiar with. But I think the open canvas differs mostly in the sense that there's community is really at the center of this. And so again, going back to designing for community participation and sharing. Um, so this is, this is what the open canvas is important for. Um, so, so I'm skipping around a lot. I'm gonna walk you through this. So you start up at the top, top left, the left, well, the left, <laughs> with defining the problem that your project is trying to solve. So for example, open life science, let's say, is trying to solve a problem where um, a lot of people would like to learn more about open science, but doesn't know how to approach it, for example. Um, so it could be one, it could be three, but I suggest really spending some time thinking about this for your own project. The proposed solution, so you've all uh, thought about this already because that was part of your um, OLS application. So just detail a bit sort of how your proposed solution is supposed to address each of the problems that you've mentioned in the previous rectangle. How will you measure success? So how, what, how do you know that you're at a good place with your project? How do you know your solution has addressed the problem and to what extent? So think, have a think about this. So for example, for open life science, this could be things like, oh, we've got you know, one cohort with 30 people. So the amount of people could be one way we measure the success of our project, but there are many more um, ways that you could do this. And then walking down, um, bottom left, uh, resources that are required to build your solution. So, there's this concept called minimal viable product, which is um, the most, let's say, minimal version of your proposed solution. So what do you need to build that? There could be um, money, that could be people, that could be um, hardware, so laptop or software or other things. But have a think about this. And then we move to the right, where we really start touching on the community part of this. So who would you like to um, contribute to your work, uh, to, the, to building this community together? Who are they? What are they like? Um, what do they look like? I, by that, I, sometimes this goes into you know, really trying to visualize like their faces and maybe what they wear and et cetera. Um, we we'll go on to that a little bit more when we talk about personas, I think in a few weeks time. But yeah, think about, you know, who your contributors could be. So for us, it could be for open life science, again, it could be something like, you know, uh, researchers, maybe people who are enthusiastic about open science, maybe citizen scientists, maybe, um, you know, uh, people working in research support and re research infrastructure. So. I would say all of these are within our contributors profiles. So um, have a think about who you'd like to see contributing to the project. Um, so your contributors profile should somewhat match um, the sort of people, uh, the people that you need to be able to build that solution. And then Going, moving up, uh, user profiles. So when you build the solution, who are you building it for? Um, 
who are your target audience and early adopters. So it's also good to think about, again, what they look like um, and maybe a bit about sort of maybe what they do or what their uh, social circles are like, for example. Um, again, we go into that a little bit more in the part that we talk about personas in a couple of weeks. Channels. So how would your contributors and then also how would your users hear about your project? How would you, how would you reach out to them? Where do they usually spend time? What kind of spaces do, you, do they usually spend time in? Um, it's also good to think about that so you can understand how you can better reach them and um, gain them as contributors and users. So this is what we talk about when we say community engagement. So contributors are often a subset of users. Uh, this it may sound surprising, but um, actually your users, you know, have that first-hand experience of using the solution and hence can provide very um, useful and insightful um, input to how you should, together, should build your solution forward. Um, so I think for me, at least, this is a large part of what community engagement is about. And um, uh, I think this is uh, definitely one way that we'd like to think about our open projects. And then last but not least, top right, you, unique value proposition. So this is um, where you clearly state what you are offering and why you are different from um, other solutions maybe in, out there in, in the world. So what are you, what can you uniquely provide to your community of contributors and users? So uh, that's the open canvas. Here is an example. Um, not going to go through it this in too much detail. Um, and I think, yeah, there, there, there will be more examples. Um, we can put more as well in the, in the etherpad probably. Uh, but, but you can see that, you know, again, walking through that path, starting with the problem of lack of recognition, for example, and then coming with the badges, it's the proposed solution, number of people who use badges and um, the resources required. So it could be development and design work that is required to build those badges. Who is contributing and using? Um, so there are the developers, devs here, who are contributing to building these badges. Can they match up with the resources that are required? Um, how do you um, incentivize the devs to contribute to the project? And then users likewise thinking about where they are and um, what would, how would you reach them potentially? And then finally the unique value proposition up here on the top right. Um, yeah, just that, you know, really giving credits to authors of academic papers. So this is what this project is all about and this is what it uniquely proposes to the community. So it's a bit of a form filling exercise, but it's a worthwhile one, I would say. I've used this many, many times. And one suggestion I would have is if you work in a team, um, do do it together with your team. So this could be either you all take the time to fill one out yourself and you can compare what you come up with and you'll see you know, the bits where you all agree and the bits where you might wanna spend some time clarifying. Um, or you can you know, print a massive version and then everyone put down what they think um, in each of the boxes uh, with post-its or other things when in-person meetings are a thing. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so there are different ways to do this, but doing this in a team is just a lot more fun and a lot more insightful, I think, often. With that, this is the template. I think Yo has very helpfully put the link in the chat. Um, thank you. And I shall welcome any and all questions. You don't have a, if you have any questions, please do feel free to put them in the Zoom chat. Um, I've also just put in a question section for y'all um, under line 165. And I see it coming through. Uh, Silchia, I hope I got the name right, <laughs> asked, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, the example is useful. Are there any others? Um, we'll try to find some of them. I think uh, you may be able to find it, some of them on our GitHub repo um, from the last cohorts, but I'll, I'll have a dig and put it in the 
uh, etherpad right after. And I'm just looking at this question coming through. Ah, yo, thank you. So Yo's put down the um, last cohorts sort of uh, issue board. Um, this is where we ask, we will ask you to do the same, which is to share what you're doing. Um, you'll hear more about that uh, later towards the close. But yeah, we ask you to share what you're doing on um, our GitHub repo as an issue. So this is why all the canvases from the last cohorts are there. Um, <laughs> But do browse through if you're looking for more examples. OK, question. What can I do if I don't have a unique value proposition, but redoing someone else's work? Is there a way to phrase UVP? That's, I, I love, first of all, can I just say that redoing someone else's work is a great thing to do um, in a way that, you know, if you are, if you think that you could, you know, improve upon or build upon other people's work. And um, that's that's great. Instead of doing it, inventing a new thing from scratch to solve the same problem. Um, the unique value, in my opinion, is you know what you're adding on top of someone else's work when you're redoing it, right? So it may take some time, it will change. It's not static, definitely. Um, but you are, and you're, the way that you're thinking about your solution is the unique value in a way, right? And try and think about how that converts to value for your contributors and users. I would say this is how I would approach it. I don't know if uh, your Malvika has, um, or any of you have other things to add. I love that you said that you are the unique value and I, I love uh, how you phrased it. Thank you. I just wanted to volunteer that I think, given that uh, science often has a replication crisis, that also redoing someone's work is fabulous too. You know, often we can't manage that. So if you can, that's awesome. And that is, in fact, a unique value. Definitely. Yeah. I cannot agree more. OK, if you have any further questions about open canvases, uh, do drop them on Slack and we'll try our best to answer them. Uh, I hand over to Yo. Okay, folks. So we've had some talking, uh, or rather you've had some listening and Emmy's had some talking, um, but now we will give you the chance to do some more talking. Um, so we have another breakout room. Um, so this time uh, you've now been in RLS, uh, this is the third week. Um, so you've probably thought a bit about your project um, whilst you're doing your applications and whilst um, you've been looking at the assignments and so on. So uh, this time your chance is to share your project mission and vision with one other person in a breakout room. I've tried to make them different. Um, Lily, that should be fine. And um, so yeah, we have groups of two this time rather than two or three. Uh, spend, breakout rooms are five, 10 minutes, spend five minutes talking about your project mission and vision and getting feedback from your uh, colleague who's in the room and uh, spend five minutes listening to your colleague and um, offering them feedback on their vision. And no worries, uh, Silcia, and I, again, I hope I said that right. You will have to school us if we get it wrong again. Um, lovely to have you and hop off, it'll be great. <laughs> have a good evening. Uh, and okay, yeah, given that, um, I will need to shuffle the rooms just a tiny bit so that we don't have anyone sitting and looking very lonely. We'll have one group of three. Move to spoken room four. Okay, yep, so five minutes, share your stuff, listen to your colleague, then switch around, uh, 10 minutes total. Clear, can I have a thumbs up if it is? I have thumbs, this is incredible. Okay, folks, um, uh, rooms will open and three, two, one. Melvika, um, should we go to the rooms if we've been assigned to one? Um, Jessica, if you wish, yeah, you can. I think your your input there will be helpful. Okay, yeah, cool. If it, if... I'm going to start recording. Thank you so much. Um, so, 
Right, hopefully you've had some good chats with your partners in your room, just um, you talk, talking about what your plans are. Maybe you want to iterate on your um, mission or vision statements based on the discussions that you've had, or maybe you feel like, actually, I've got a really good statement. You know, I, I am on fire and this is amazing. Um, so what we're going to talk about next, we're going to talk a little bit about road mapping as a way of welcoming people. Um, so to do that, this is me talking now for a little bit. So I am going to share my screen. Okay, this should be just the Firefox in question. No, that's not going to work, is it, when I put it on present mode? Okay, let me stop the share and try again. <laughs> um, share screen and desktop two and present. Okay, I don't see that. Close that. Okay, can we all see the screen that I'm intending people to see in present mode? No. God damn it. <laughs> You're not again. sharing. I'm not sharing. I tried. Don't know what happened. How about now? Yes. Excellent. Okay. IT skills. What are they? Right. So we're going to talk a little bit about road mapping as a way of welcoming people. Um, so this is part of the concept about making sure that you are designing openness into your projects. Um, next screen. So um, we will also look at some examples of what roadmaps could look like. Um, and at the end of the call, the, one of your tasks will be to, uh, to try and design a roadmap for your project as well. Uh, so this sentence already from this call may be a little bit familiar to you. Um, again, we've highlighted different specific parts this time. So here we're talking about open leaders designing uh, and building projects to empower others to collaborate within, open, uh, within inclusive communities. Um, and within the open leadership framework, we're focusing on designing for participation and inclusion. I think specifically the second uh, and last bullet point here, uh, designing for community interactions and for project identity. Um, so the first thing is that when you are uh, trying to build a collaborative project, you want to have a welcoming space. And that means that you want to make a really good first impression so that people are actually, yeah, this is where I want to be. Um, because the, the other side of that is if someone comes and there's, there's no indication that anyone want, is welcome to contribute, they may think they're in the wrong place and wonder if this is in fact where you're supposed to be contributing. Um, so if you've ever seen almost anything I'm involved with, if I try and make stuff welcoming, there ends up being a lot of emoji. Um, there are other ways to make things welcoming apart from emoji. Um, but trying to set a friendly tone, you know, hello, we're, we're delighted to see you, here's how to contribute, etc. is a really important. Uh, so I just realized that title is a bit weird. What, what goes in a roadmap? Close enough. It's all good. Um, what goes in a roadmap? The three things we're going to talk about is um, a project, project summary. So um, it's nice to see what everyone's doing, um, but you also want to know what the project is about that you're working on. How to get started. Uh, sometimes there may be specific steps people need to carry out if they want to become involved with you with your work. Um, and then the timeline for what's actually going to be happening as part of your roadmap. Um, so the project summary and welcome. Um, this is the hello, here's, here's what our project is, here's what we're doing, here's where we plan to go. This is often a very high level thing. This might be a paragraph, uh, something like that, just to get people oriented and comfortable. Um, and it also means that even if the only thing that they've linked to in the roadmap is that roadmap, that they still know what your project is. So don't assume um, that they've read all your other documentation as well. Um, how to get involved, like I mentioned earlier, um, making sure that the pathways to getting contributing are available can be very helpful. Um, point to parts of project that people can actually work on. Um, I, when you're thinking more advanced, I would also think about little things as well as bigger and more advanced and complex things as well, because different people will want to pick up different types and levels of task. Um, and point to documentation and ways to get help that people can get to check out as well. The, the, the onboarding docs. And then timeline, which is probably the biggest thing um, in a roadmap. Um, and that's something that probably will be changing a lot over time. Uh, so this is about, we'll go into even more depth in one of the later calls about like breaking things down into smaller tasks um, and setting these milestones and goals. But very broadly, you might want to say, in the next month or in the short term, I want to do X. And then once we've done those, we will do Y and we will do Z. And then after that, what's happening next? So that 
this is something that starts specific when it's closer to you in time and that perhaps gets a bit vaguer the further away we get. Um, but that means that anyone who hops into the project knows what the direction of the project is, what the plans are, and wh where they can participate and contribute as well. Um, so you may want to have milestones. These are the bigger ones. These are the bigger things. So for example, um, when we were planning open life science for the very first cohort, um, one of our milestones was get our website up. Uh, and then the next milestone might be get recruiting and launch applications. And then another milestone might have been something like accept and announce the applications. Um, and so there's a lot of details that goes into each of these, but each individual one is a nice clear step that you can define. Um, you may want to add dates for those um, that can help you hold, hold on to them and fulfill them when you add dates. Um, and then the timeframes um, might just be vaguer. It might be that we want to do this soon or we want to do it in 2021 or 2022, something like that. Um, and one to three milestones is often great for a very early in a project. Um, I think it's reasonable to say that if you have 72 milestones, there's a good chance that you may expect some of those to change by the time you actually get to number 63. Um, so it doesn't have to be incredibly elaborately detailed. Um, and then have some tasks within each milestone. So um, that can be information about how to, how to get on with these tasks, um, what it should look like when it's done, um, and why it's important, how it relates to your vision or how it completes your goals in some way or um, makes a step towards your goals. Uh, so I'm going to see if I can open up some examples. Um, let me see if I get a smaller screen again. Okay. Um, let's make that as big as possible. And righty. So this here, I'm going to go actually for a couple specifically that were done in OLS 3 as some nice roadmaps that people produced in the previous cohort. Um, so here you can see this is a, actually um, what's also known as Kanban board, but you can see stuff that still needs to be done. You can see stuff that is active at the moment, and you can see stuff that has already been done. It just means that if anyone pops in, they already they, they know that these are tasks that need to be picked up. Um, we have another example, which is the Conga Physics. Um, and again, same, same sort of format, to do, in progress, and done. Uh, quite delightful to see how much of it has been done. <laughs> um, and you can also see some of the other milestones here that they're, they're thinking about that maybe they don't have specific tasks for yet. Um, so this just uh, briefly mentioning this is on GitHub, which you can see, and we will go into more detail about GitHub later in um, week five. Um, and there are recordings online and it will be recorded if you can't make the week five call as well. Um, so there are other ways that you can do this, for example. So um, you could put this rather than having the individual issues, which we saw just now, and we, we will talk about how to do those more later on. So don't worry if it's a little bit um, unfamiliar at the moment. Um, but here's one that we set up in an issue when we were, let's make that a bit bigger, um, writing our roadmap for applications for OLS in 2019. So we have the same information. We, we tell people what our project is, um, it was 15 weeks, now it's 16. How you can get involved if you want to be involved. Um, we have broken down little milestones. Uh, so for example, choosing an application platform, we used EasyChair, uh, communications around this, and we also have some dates as well. So when applications open. Um, and so basically this was really useful for us, but also anyone else who might have been interested could have, could have gotten involved um, if they wished to as well. Um, I think, is that everything on my slides? Yes, yes it is. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. We have five minutes, which means wrap up. And if there's any little questions, because it was a super fast zoom through road mapping, I didn't go into the technical de de details of GitHub, which we showed. Questions are very welcome in the chat or in um, the unmuted or in the um, etherpad. Yes, um, there will be a more in-depth in intro into uh, week five into GitHub. Um, and I think week four, we have more detail about, um, we, we have a talk on agile and iterative project um, management, which also goes into more detail and in breaking down into tasks um, and allowing people to contribute.
Okay, um, since we need a couple of minutes to wrap up, I will hand it to Malvika. Um, Thank you, you. Um, right before you came back from the breakout, we were talking about how some of the things we will say will sound jargon to you and we apologize for that, but we hope that over period we are more clear on what we are saying and how they make sense. So please ask us, no, no question is too small. So I wanna start with by saying that we have a mailing list where you've been added. We have a Google calendar, you've been sent in right through. If you haven't received any of those, you don't know what it means, please uh, send us a message and we will make sure that uh, you're added. And we have a Slack channel. We really, really encourage you to join the Slack channel, mostly because a lot of conversation that happens, you don't need to be part of it, but you can see it and you would learn from it. So if you're very shy at asking questions, you can also see how others are asking and, and uh, you know, be part, uh, get involved. Second is we have micro grant. We've already communicated that, but we want to make sure that you're taking advantage of it. So if you're in a house with multiple people, you please buy a headphone. Uh, if you are uh, in a very low internet area or if you need generator to be able to attend these calls, uh, please take advantage of it. There are other ways, just ask us if you're not sure if the micro grant covers it, but the micro grant is also available for projects. If you're launching a project and if you need some branding related cost uh, to be covered, you can reach out to us. You can discuss a lot of stuff on again Slack. Uh, we have cohort names. We always ask our cohort members to choose cohort names. So first cohort was called Open Seats. Second cohort was Masked Cohort because right then the pandemic had started. Then the Perseverance because people are learning to be perseverant through this tough time. So now it's your chance to choose what you would like this cohort to be called. You can add them below uh, in the uh, line number. Let me Let me make it bigger. It is from line number 217 onward, but you can also chat about it on Slack. Again, this week we have lots of assignments for you. Don't get intimidated. There is no compulsion to finish them, all, finish all of them, or no one's going to assess or judge or score it. But we really hope that you get to do it in the next couple of weeks. The first thing you want to do is create an issue. Uh, if you're not familiar at all with GitHub, uh, please let us know and we will uh, help you create that because it's uh, already too late. I don't want to keep you all hanging here. Just let us know that you don't know what GitHub is. We're going to help you. But the easiest way for you would be is uh, please follow the instruction again in line number 223 uh, and we will be able to see that. Also, uh, we, have a, we have a couple of compare and contrast exercise, reflection exercise, and a, a template for open canvas and template for roadmap. All of these are available from line 20, 221 onward. Again, it looks intimidating, but we hope that we'll get through it before the end of this cohort. Um, next week, we have a cohort call again in the same time, but this week you should also make sure that you're meeting your mentor mentee the week after, we will have an introduction to GitHub for those who are super new to it. And with that, we are end of the call and we made it in time, which is miraculous. So glad to see you all. Uh, thank you for joining. We are very, very excited to have you in Open Life Science fourth cohort and uh, can't wait to see how your project and uh, network develops. So have a great end of the day, morning, or wherever you are, whatever time you are in. Take care. Thank you all.